Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Let me echo everything that's been said this morning. It's good to be here with you today and uh, good to see uh, our regular attenders and good to have visitors all the way from New York this morning. And so uh, we're grateful about that. And uh, being from Michigan, I'm always glad to see anyone who's from the north. So uh, that, that's good. Uh, born and raised up there. But to all of our regular folks, it's good to see you and some who are back with us today as well. Uh, it's just good. And so uh, we're thankful for the fellowship that we get to enjoy here at New Life, right? And uh, something that we need to uh, just to be thankful for and encourage others. So um, I think in these day and age, um, people are just feeling really kind of separated, disenfranchised, if you will. And, and we need that sense of community. We need that sense of, I look forward to going to, uh, to be with God's people. And so uh, encourage people if you can in that way. In your bulletin this morning, you can see a little outline I thought might be helpful as we work our way through a, one of my favorite topics and certainly one of the most important subjects in the Bible, and that is the grace of God. And this morning we're going to emphasize how we can say it's uh, important, but we need to say essential, uh, how irreplaceable the grace of God is and how we would be lost without the grace of God. And then if we want to go to heaven, we need the grace of God. There truly is no other way. And so certainly this is one of those texts that is going to be uh, much bigger than a, a little sermon could possibly cover, but maybe it will whet your appetite for your own studies. Maybe it will open the door uh, to further studies here, but we just need to be reminded of the importance of grace. Uh, it is often, it's a word that is often used in the scripture. How many times in your memory can you think about reading the epistles of Paul and he begins with grace and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. And really what Paul does there is kind of cool. Now, when we walk by each other in the day, we might say hi. If you're from the real south, like North Carolina, say hey. And uh, th this is your way of greeting one another. Hey, how's it going? Good to see you. Hello. That's a greeting. Now, in Paul's culture, in the Greek culture, they would use a form of the word grace, chirine, uh, which means joy to you. That's kind of nice, isn't it? And, and, and a lot of you remember the Hebrew word shalom, which means peace. peace. And so Paul takes the typical Greek greeting of the day, grace, and the typical Hebrew greeting of the day, peace, and he puts them together, grace and peace. But how much more important is that to us as Christians, knowing that we are saved by the grace of God, and because we have grace from God, we now have peace with God. And it's just a great way to remember that. Uh, another thing he does, uh, John says in chapter 1 and verse 16, From him we have received grace upon grace. Now, I was raised in the Midwest, and uh, you know we had lakes around for sure. But I remember moving to North Carolina and going to the Outer Banks and seeing the Atlantic for the very first time and standing out there in the Outer Banks and just seeing one wave after another, wave upon wave upon wave. It doesn't stop. And here is John saying, from God we have received grace upon grace upon grace. And we just start to realize how big grace is. How essential and important grace is to all of us. And then that very well a familiar verse in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse number 8. We need to have this one underlined. This one committed to memory. For by grace you are saved through faith. By grace you're saved. And in the back of your mind, just to put this little note now, because we will come back to it, we are not saved by our works. you believe that? We are not saved by how good we are. You know, he, he's a really good God. We're not saved because we deserve to go to heaven. Is that true? We are saved by the grace of God. Grace. By grace are you saved through faith. That not, of, that not of yourself. It is a gift from God. Not as a result of works. 
lest no one should boast. So all praise and glory goes to God who saved us because he loved us and he gave us grace. And now our lives are going to reflect that in the way that we live for him. So many of our favorite songs just come and, and, and just bring to us this thought of grace. Uh, the first one there is from the hymn, Come Thou Fount. Great old hymn. We don't sing that as much as we need to. But the third stanza says, Oh, to grace, how great a debtor. Daily I am constrained to be. Let thy goodness like a fetter. Find my wandering heart to thee. I mean, just an amazing, we are debtors due to the grace of God. Another one now, uh, Ian, where's Ian here? One day when we're a congregation, about 100, 150, we really do need to start singing, mar or, excuse me, uh, uh, the idea of um, uh, wonderful grace of Jesus. I don't know if that one made it on the screen or not. Wonderful grace of Jesus. Greater than all our sin. How shall my tongue describe it? Where shall my praise begin? Now, as a piano player, Mary, Mary you can probably, that's not one of the easiest hymns in the world to play, is it? You know, that, that, that takes a little work, and you got sopranos, you got the bass, and great old hymn. We need to work on that one day. Grace, the gift of God's love. You know, the, there's two songs that they say are the most popular, most loved the hymns among Christians. One is, How Great Thou Art. And uh, I mean, who doesn't love that hymn? The other is, Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound, That Saved a Wretch Like Me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. We sing about the wonderful grace of Jesus, marvelous grace of our loving Lord. And so this, this concept needs to be there as important to us as well. Now, maybe it would be good to just kind of work it. There's a lot of definitions that people use for grace uh, that we can talk about a little bit. Uh, one of the common ones is unmerited favor. The idea of getting something you don't deserve. Now, a good way to illustrate that would be uh, your paycheck. If you get paid you know, every other week, well, first to 15th, however it works out. When you get your paycheck, is that a gift? No, you, you did what for it? You worked for it. You earned it. And so they're not giving you that check or that direct deposit just because they like you because you're a great person. They're giving it to you because they owe you that money for what you work for. A lot of us remember when we were kids around our birthday time or something, you'd go to the mailbox and there's that envelope from Dear Aunt Sally and then there was a card which you kind of looked at and then you started looking and, and then Sally sent us a $10 bill. Back in my day, that was a big deal. Uh, I didn't work for that, did I? I didn't earn it. She gave me that because she, because she loved me. Because she cared about me. Oh, that is the difference between works and grace. Works are what you deserve. Grace is what you get because someone loves you. By the way, the wages of sin is death. The free gift of God, this grace is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Uh, unmerited favor is pretty good. Sometimes people use an acrostic and yeah, there's good and there's bad and all of that. Uh, I do like this one here. Grace could be God's riches at Christ's expense. We get the greatness of God, the forgiveness, the love, the mercy, the kindness, knowing we're in the right relationship. We didn't earn that. We don't deserve it. It's not said, oh, but Blair did it a number of good things today. No, it doesn't work that way. Jesus died on the cross. He, uh, the old uh, hymn says, I owed a debt I couldn't pay, and it was growing every day, but Jesus paid it all for me. God's riches at Christ's expense. I can work with that one. That's not uh, so bad here. Uh, I do like this one, though, and uh, this has been said to be the root idea of grace. A gift that makes glad. By grace are you saved through faith. That not of yourself. It's a gift of God. The greatest gift God could ever give was the gift of his only begotten son. What does John 3.16 say? For God so loved the world that he, that he gave. He gave a gift, his only begotten son. That whosoever believes in him should not perish, 
but have everlasting life. If you have your Bibles with you today, and I hope you do, I invite your attention to the book of Acts chapter 15. Acts chapter 15, and uh, just a moment or two, we're going to read verses 7 down to 11. Acts 15, 7 through 11. Here's what we find. After much discussion, Peter got up and addressed them. Brothers, you know that sometime God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. God, who knows the heart, showed that he accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit to them, just as he did to us. He did not discriminate between us and them, for he purified their hearts by faith. Now then, why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of the Gentiles a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors have been able to? To bear. Did you start seeing that stuff? You have faith in there, you have belief in God. And then he just sums it all up in verse 11, and Peter says, No, we believe it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved just as they are. If you remember Acts 15, this is the idea do you have to be a Jew to be saved? Do you have to follow the law of Moses, the Old Testament stuff, in order to be saved? Peter said, look, we couldn't do it. Our ancestors couldn't do it. Why try to make the Gentiles do it? No. We believe that we are saved through the grace of our Lord Jesus. And that's the way they're going to be saved. That's the way we are going to be saved. You might put it this way. Everyone who goes to heaven gets there by grace. No one deserves to go to heaven. And yet in our mind, we constantly think that. i got to be good enough to go. If I'm not good enough, I'm not going to get to heaven. Friends, I hate to be the bearer of bad news here. None of us are good enough to go to heaven. Now, I blame some musical lyrics for us thinking that. Uh, some of you may go far enough back to remember a guy by the name of well, Ricky Nelson. Uh, Ricky used to sing, Oh, where, oh, where can my baby be? You know, and then she, he says, uh, She's gone to heaven, so I got to be good. So I can see my baby when I leave this world. I got to be good so I can go to heaven. Now, uh, if you know me long enough, you'll know pretty soon I'll probably mention Brooks and Dunn. Well, sadly enough, as good as the number of their songs are, there's a song they sing called Believe. And uh, about an old man, it says, If ever there was someone who deserved a ticket to the other side, it would be that sweet old man. Hmm. He deserved it. He worked for it. And so it's owed to them. Uh, and remember uh, uh, Alan Jackson, you know, sitting on the front porch and working hard to get to heaven. It's just in our thinking that we got to work, we got to earn it, we got to deserve it. Paul, uh, Peter says, no. We believe it's through the grace of our Lord Jesus. I guess that means don't get your theology from country music, okay? Uh, you know, there's probably a lot of other things you shouldn't get from country music either. But that's a sermon for another time. Uh, but the idea is if you want your theology to be right, get it from the scripture. For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourself. It is the gift of God that needs to be where our thinking goes this morning. So let's uh, explore this a little bit. One thing we might be able to say, if you like to kind of work through it, when we are saved, it is by grace. It's through faith. We receive the benefits of it when we are immersed into Christ at baptism, and the purpose for it is that we might do good works. We are not saved by our good works, but they are an expression of our love for Christ. They are an, a, an expression of our Gratitude, God did this for me. I know I can never earn it. I know I can never pay it back. I know I will be a debtor to him, but for the rest of my life, I'm going to strive to please him in all that I do. You see, if salvation were by works, and it's not, it wouldn't be grace. The scripture is just very definite, is it not? For by grace are you saved through faith? Peter said, no, it's by the grace of the God that we are saved. And so sometimes we think, well, God did his part, i got to do my part. Is it a 50-50 kind of deal? 
50% of what Jesus did and 50% of what Blair does. That, 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 that's going to be right. No. Well, 75 God and 25 me. No. 99 one? No. We are saved 100% by the blood of Christ. Do you believe that this morning? Amen. And I'm going to live my life hopefully in a way that expresses my gratitude to God in worship and in praise for all that he has done for me. But yet, sometimes we think, well, you know, yeah, that's what the Bible says about grace. And I, I'm with you, but I still think i got to do my part, too. Let's talk about that just for a minute. Let's say that there's someone who says, you know, I think I can go to heaven without Jesus. I think that I don't have to be a Christian to go to heaven. I can just be a good person. Have you ever met that person? Who said, uh, I actually have. Uh, I've met the person who says, you know, uh, all I got to do is be a good husband and father, never kick my dog, pay my taxes, and, you know, just be a good, not cheat my spouse, whatever it might be, and then I can go to heaven. Do you know that the scriptures say that in order to be saved by how good you are, you have to be 100% perfect. Can you imagine that? Being 100% perfect. And if you want to say you're on the road right now, <laughs> not me, oh, no, not by a long shot. What does Galatians 3.10 say? It says, for all who are of the works of the law are under a curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not abide by all the things written in the book of the law to do them. If you want to be saved by your good works and earning your way into heaven, you've got to be 100% perfect. 100%. Now, can you imagine this just for a moment? Now, I know this is kind of silly, but we're going to go with it, okay? Imagine that your life has been perfect. All the way through your growing up years, your rebellious, you never had a rebellious teen year, you've been a good person all the way, and, and you're like on your way to being 100% perfect, and one day you've been to Publix, you've loaded your groceries in your car, and when you get home, you lift the bag, and it was, there was something wrong with the bag, and a big jar of mayonnaise falls, hits the concrete, and you say something you shouldn't have said. Something came out of your mouth, you don't even know where that word came from, but you know you shouldn't have said it. You're no longer perfect, are you? You no longer deserve it. You need someone to pay the price for your sins, and it can't be you. You say, now it's kind of silly because we know that we've done way more stuff than just drop a jar of mayonnaise and say stuff we shouldn't have said. But you see, this is what Paul is saying. Cursed is everyone who does not abide by all things. If you want to be saved by being a good person, you got to not just be good, you got to be perfect. And we know in our hearts that we are a long way from that. Uh, you could say it this way. you say, one strike and you're out. One little oops. What does James 2.10 say? For whoever keeps the whole law, yet stumbles in one point, has become guilty of all. Uh, you remember uh, back in 1994, a lot of you were around in 1994, there was a little matter of a trial going on out in California. A man had been accused of murdering his ex-wife and his ex-wife's boyfriend, date, whatever it must be. You know, who is that guy? I'll just give you a hint. If the gloves don't fit, you must acquit. You know, okay, we all were talking about the OJ trial. Now, I have to admit, I, I was hooked on the O.J. trial. Uh, court TV, I'd watch that. CNN, when, back when it was watchable, I would watch CNN. And, and, you know, and I'd keep up with it. And I remember my kids say, did he do it? Did he? Well, you know, here he looks guilty. There he looks uh, not guilty. And you all know how that turned out. The jury came back and said, we, the jury, find the defendant. Orenthal James Simpson, not guilty. He got to get the Bentley again. He got to go back to the mansion in Brentwood again. And then the eyes of the law, <coughs> debate it all you want. He was found not guilty. Now, I remember I was preaching back in the day, and, and I wrote a sermon, and I called it More Guilty Than O.J. <laughs> you see, because the bottom line was, I wasn't out in California in 1994. When that event happened, I was doing church camp in Washington, North Carolina. I wasn't there. I have an opinion, but I wasn't there. So I could say, I don't really know, but I know what I've done. And it may not be murder, I promise you, it was not double murder. 
But here's what James says. Whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles in one point has become guilty of all. Now that ought to humble us a minute because we do like to point our fingers. I'd never do what O.J. Simpson did. I'd never do what that president did. I'd never put our neighbor down the road with the stuff they're doing. Whoever keeps the whole law and stumbles in one point, they become guilty of all. Doesn't that kind of remind you of Romans 3, verse 23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We need grace. Because as much as we might like to pat ourselves in the back and think, well, I'm better than him, and I'm way better than her, and better than the rest of them. No. We are sinners. We need salvation. We need forgiveness. And we cannot earn salvation. We cannot earn our forgiveness. We need to put our faith in the one who did lead a perfect life and gave his life willingly for us on the cross. So you could just put it this way, that works don't work. Uh, one of my favorite all-time professors uh, wrote a little booklet called Being Good Enough Isn't Good Enough. There's truth in that. Oh, they're good enough. They're going to be there. No, we're not good enough. So Jesus died on the cross for us. Being saved by grace means that there's more to Christianity than just rules or regulations. And sometimes we live our life that way, that, you know, Christianity is a bunch of do's and don'ts. A uh, Bible college professor once said, you don't drink, you don't smoke, you don't chew, and you don't go with girls who do. Now, I don't know where the world he came up with that. But, but you know, sometimes we live, we just have that, um, we just have that mindset, can't do this, can't do that, got to do that. Aren't you glad there's more to Christianity than just rules and regulations to follow? That there's a heavenly father who loves us so much. There's brothers and sisters in Christ that we can encourage and that they can encourage and motivate us to do better. I like what the Proverbs say, iron sharpens iron. You encourage me to live the kind of life that God wants me to live, and hopefully we do that for you as well. But some people look at Christianity as just drudgery. Do you know that? Oh, you Christians, you don't have any fun. You can't do this. You can't do that. Don't you enjoy the fellowship we have together? The freedom that we have because Jesus gave his life on the cross for us. What does that mean for us in a practical way? I think it means this. We recognize that we've been saved by the blood of Christ. I can't save myself. I can't save any of y'all either. Jesus Christ gave his life on the cross that he can save the whole world. In this is love, not that we love God, and that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation, the means of atonement for our sins. In 1 John 2, 1 and 2, it says uh, that um, uh, Jesus died not just for the sins of a few, but for the whole world. We are saved by the blood of Christ. And when you start talking about living a perfect life, you know, there's only been one who has done that, right? Even Pontius Pilate, you remember what he said during one of the trials of Jesus? He says, I find no guilt in this man. Why are you crucifying what, him? What has he done wrong? Jesus lived a 100% perfect life from start to finish. From the moment he entered the world as a baby in Bethlehem to the time he was uh, uh, lifted up into heaven, he lived a sinless and perfect life, and thus his blood is able to forgive the sins of those who are less than perfect. You might read 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I love the verse where Paul says, God made him who knew no sin, he didn't know any sin, to be sin on our behalf. That we might become the righteousness of God in him. The perfect lamb of God took on himself the sins of the world. That we might have our sins forgiven. And thus I think we ought to see Christianity as a joy-filled relationship with God. Based on what Jesus did for us. We ought to have joy in our hearts because look it's hard when you realize I don't deserve this. How many times have we put our head in our pillow at night and said, God, forgive me for this sin, whatever it was. 
And the next night, we're right back here. God, I did it again. Please forgive me. And it just starts to weigh on our minds and our hearts that we know we fail God. We know that we are farther from him than we would like to be. And yet, by the blood of Christ, those who are far off have been brought near. And that there is still forgiveness and grace in God. And that ought to just give us a sense of joy, a sense of relief. A sense that this is not what you're going to get out in the world. You know why? Because if you're of a mindset that i got to be good enough to get there, you will feel like a failure every time. Because you know at the end of the day, the stuff you said you shouldn't have said, the relationships that you shouldn't be in, stuff you've looked at, places you've gone, the money you spent, all those things that you know give us a sense of guilt. A sense of failure, a sense of we just don't measure up, it'll tear you up. But when you start realizing that in God there's forgiveness, by the blood of Christ there's forgiveness for our sins, that should bring to us an, just a sense of peace with God. Our lives should reflect, I think, and demonstrate that we've been saved by grace. That's why there ought to be joy in this fellowship. You don't see a lot of joy out in the world right now, do you? You see people who are scared, the down, uh, downcast. Remember Jesus described, I think, people of this day as sheep without a shepherd because they don't know what's going to happen. They don't know what's going to happen with their jobs, inflation, the price of gas. They don't know what's going to happen in the big world situation, Russia, China, all that kind of stuff. They don't know what's going on really in their family in some cases. But we ought to have that peace that passes all understanding because our trust is in the one who gave his life for us and rose from the dead. We ought to have that sense of peace. And Paul said in Romans, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Grace and peace. Jesus said, in this world you'll have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. We have peace with God. Peace because of the grace of God. Christians strive, I think, to please and obey God as a result of being saved by the blood of Christ. It's true. We are not saved by our works. But friends, I'll tell you this, our lives ought to reflect our gratitude for being saved. We ought to have good work. Well, let's talk about that just for a minute here as we get ready to wrap it up. We have been saved for good works. So Ephesians 2 verse 10 says, he said, by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourself, it's the gift of God, not as a result of works, lest no one should boast. And then he says, for we are his workmanship. Created in God by Christ Jesus for good works. And so, well, we should walk in these good works that God has for us to do. Not that we will be saved, but because we have been saved. Do you get the difference there? We are not saved by our good works, but our good works show that we are in a right relationship with God. How about this one out of the book of James? James says, faith without works is dead. You know, there, there really is a sense that we have good works in our life to demonstrate that our faith is alive. That we want to serve God who saved us from our sin. And then this one here, because we really do need this reminder. And I don't want anyone going out of here saying, well, Blair says we can live any old way we want to live. We can sin as much as we want. And, uh, and, and that's going to be cool with God. It's not cool with God. Okay? You heard me say it. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 8, we are going to learn that obeying God is not an option. Can I say that again? Or as the sheriff of Polk County likes to say, did you hear what I said? <laughs> obeying God is not an option. What's 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 8 say? That when Jesus returns, he's going to return in flaming fire. Dealing out retribution. If you don't know, that's a big word. It means payback. He is going to pay back people for their sins to those who, number one, don't know God. And number two, to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. Obedience. It's not an option. 
It's not a take or leave it. When God says, you know, don't, um, you know, don't have any other gods before me, he still means that. When he says, don't, uh, don't commit adultery, don't murder, he still means those things. Uh, there is a right way for us to live, and we do need to live in that way for sure. We even sing a song, trust and obey. For there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. I wonder today, are you weary of always trying hard but never feeling like you're good enough to be saved? You always have those nagging doubts in the back of your mind, you know, can, you know, am I okay? If something happened to me today, if I died tonight, would I go to heaven? It's when, when you live a life of, uh, you know, uh, based on what you're doing, you're going to have those feelings, and it's a hard thing for sure. Do you need the confidence, confidence, the boldness, the assurance of knowing that your sins have been fully paid for? But if you did die today, you know that Jesus died on the cross and rose again, that you might have the hope and the promise of heaven. And yes, we do fall short of his glory, but his, uh, his grace upon grace upon grace still brings the forgiveness and the assurance of salvation that we need. Does the thought of serving Jesus, knowing that he's given you the gift of sound, uh, salvation, sound really good to you? How can I live my life as an expression of the gratitude I have for all that Jesus has done for me. You see, this brings us to a time of decision, does it not? Where we start to think, man, I've tried to be good, but I'm just not. i failed so many times I can't even count them anymore. Maybe I need to trust somebody who has paid my price, who's paid the debt I couldn't pay, as someone is Jesus Christ. To have that assurance of salvation, to know that, yes, even though we're not perfect, Jesus still is, and there's still a place in heaven for us. We're trying, but we're trusting him, and that we know that God is living and working within us. If you're not um, confident, if you're not assured of those things this morning, as we get ready to sing our invitation hymn today, we'll invite you to come and just grab one of us, and we'll be glad to speak to you. We'll be glad to introduce you to a relationship with God, which is by faith, not by works. We'll talk about confessing Christ as Savior, repenting of sins, being baptized for the forgiveness of sins, the gift of the Holy Spirit, and following him with grateful hearts. Let's pray together this morning. Heavenly Father, we say thank you for that gift that we could never repay, the gift that we could never have earned. We're thankful in your great love you provided a way for us to be saved through the precious blood of Jesus Christ, unblemished and spotless, the Lamb of God. Lord, we're thankful that you still keep calling us 2,000 years later to leave the world of sin and to return to you, knowing that in you there's hope, there's forgiveness, and there's peace. We need that peace. Lord, if anyone here needs to make that decision today, we pray that you'd lay it on their hearts to do what you would have them to do. Bless us as we as a church would try to serve you better. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to stand and sing invitation song this morning. If you do have a decision you need to make, if you just want some prayer, we're glad to do that. We invite you to come while we sing.